welcome to Portals of Perception. I am in Singapore to lead and facilitate a strategy and innovation event and it presented a unique and rare opportunity, time zone opportunity, to meet with friends down under in Australia and New Zealand. And so we spontaneously gathered with a premise and an intent to explore some ideas that are central to the portal's exploration around development to do with the human assembly, a word, a, a, a term, a frame of mind that describes the unique sense that we humans have the capacity to configure ourselves, to create and fashion a unique configuration, a unique assembly to become, in essence, the new archetype, the new archetypes that we choose to become. So we, we are about to explore this idea, both in the professional sense and in the larger human sense with the awareness that the unique nature of human life is that we, are, we can be more than one thing. Often in history, when we reflect through time, even in recent centuries, some larger-than-life names will come to mind. Gandhi, the late queen, Dal uh, the Dalai Lama. And when you think about these people, we often get the sense of a human being that almost disappears inside the role, inside the function. And somehow they, they, they were fashioned for that role, for that function. And we are seeking to now look at a time where what became so central for the, the modern culture, and you could say that the last century or century and a half became a transitional time from aristocracy to celebritocracy. We became so obsessed with celebrities, the people that we can put on a pedestal, either to keep them on a pedestal or to knock them down from the pedestal so we can feel good about ourselves. But there is a way in which this entire culture that is so obsessed with celebrities represents the, the psychological age of 11 or 12 or 13. And the, the meta-crisis we are now experiencing is in one way an invitation for us humans to mature, to get on with the business of life and the business of the human experiment on Earth and transcend the, that psychological age of looking at those people we would put on a pedestal and truly engage with the prospect of human development and the, the consolidation of human assemblies where we can become not just one thing or one capacity or one quality, but many, multiple qualities, multiple capacities, sometimes even conflicting capacities assembled, configured into one human being without needing to be a famous person to are doing so, for doing so. So I emailed you and asked you, would you quite spontaneously, with a short notice, consider the, the prospect of human development at this time in the context of the crisis that we see everywhere on so many different levels. And the recognition that we're not going to be able to solve the big problems on the planet if we can't actually as human beings operate at a higher level of maturation. And I'm proposing that one of the dimensions of maturing as human beings is that we are prepared, we may be prepared 
to assemble ourselves as a, as a configuration, as a cosmology of capabilities and capacities and qualities. And so the, the invitation would be to, that we first go around the table and you freely choose to say whatever you want to say about yourself, whether it's a personal comment or a professional comment, and you may choose to bring whatever you want to bring into it. And I, I, we didn't even rehearse this. I didn't give you a, a chance to prepare too much. This is live. Uh, and, and then if you can, my invitation is that in this first round, you speak to what comes up for you, what, what is alive for you, what is ins inspirational for you when you hear the idea, when you think into this, this concept, this idea, this possibility of a human assembly, a configuration, a formation, an assembly formation that we actually get to shape and mold through the course of life. What is it, what is this idea, this possibility uh, bringing up for you? And that we will then proceed from there and, and see where and how the conversation unfolds. So, so please, who is ready to uh, uh, get us started? First of all, I think the, the word assembly is very interesting because to assemble something is to put it together and it's to bring it together. And I've always thought of, of myself, I guess, as almost like a community. I think the Buddhists also have that concept of uh, that we're not one thing and that allows a lot of freedom in how I, how I approach life um, because it means that I don't have to be singular. I don't have to, you know, always drink my tea the same way or um, wear one style of clothing or speak in the same way. It allows a lot of versatility and freedom. Um, and I know that one of the phrases I've, I've felt going through my life has been, and it was something I learned a long time ago, was, was that I don't define myself by what I do. So I'm a mother, but I don't say I am a mother and that's who I am, that's what I am. I'm an entrepreneur, but I don't say that is who I am. It's like I'm a person and I have children, one of my roles as a mother, one of my roles as an entrepreneur, one of many, many different faces and lives. And that allows me to move into one and out of one and change and not feel so fixed. I remember when I was a teenager that um, I, many of us, when we grow up, we kind of put clothes on and try different identities when we're teenagers. You know, we might go for the dark clothes or the bright clothes or the lots of makeup, short hair, long hair. And it's almost as though you're looking for something that that resonates and, and can sit on you and matches what you feel like inside. But as I once I moved out of teenagerhood, um, I wanted to have more flexibility and versatility and to remain unfixed so I don't have to just be one thing. Um, and I often say I still don't know what to do, what I want to be when I grow up. And I'm 52, so <laughs> I'm still working it out. <laughs> That's um, my first little stab in the dark. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. I think I have quite a few references for the word assembly, but you, the picture that came into my head was intermediate which is about when you're about 11 and 12 and this empty hall and they say we're going to have an assembly and then the doors are wide open all down the hall and at the end and then all these different people troop in and assemble and then they troop out and I was thinking your life's a wee bit like that where you know people in thinking about people who come into your life they, and and what you take on from them or borrow from them or are exampled by them um, they come in and they go out but something is residual 
from that encounter. And uh, so the hall of you is, or the temple of you, is where you um, form this assembly of influences, I suppose, and qualities. And so that's how I first thought about assembly. Indeed. So we are now the, the school assembly, each one of us inside ourselves, and, and um, the full range of characters there. Thank you. Thank you, Ilet. Well, hmm. So the invitation, um, whether I read it correctly or, or, or not correctly, I, I guess it doesn't really matter. But how I read it was, um, you know, who, who in my early years did I see as somebody who was a role model, an archetype, from whom I could perhaps emulate as a younger person some qualities that they seemed to represent? And I struggled with that proposition because I couldn't think of anyone. Um, and then I thought about it some more and I thought, well, actually, most of my early years was um, mostly confusing as a young person because as as most of us here in, in this little grouping are, we're of a similar age, and it was kind of this transitional phase, I think, in popular culture where we were moving out of the um, the grand superhero ethos and moving very much into the uh, the world of celebrity and it left me quite cold as a person as a young person these kinds of propositions and so my first probably 25 years of life was an exploration into trying out different personas And then having been labeled by a, you know, by people with whom I might mix as, oh, you're this or you're that. Oh, you're a biker, you're a hippie, you're a whatever, right? Was the signal to change into something else because it became an instant pigeonhole. And... It probably wasn't until my late 20s that I began to appreciate that what was actually required was to decide what I was going to be in 20 years' time, in 30 years' time. And then to cast around to see, well, who best represented those elements. And um, it's, and it, it, it comes across slightly as a, as a bit of a pastiche person, I suppose, unless one can actually try to give those things some theater. Um, Probably no less confusing, but certainly it, it adds an interest to life and um, of course the problem is people really never know who they're dealing with. Mm. Oh, I've got you now. I, I Hang on, no. You're not a scientist. You're an artist. Hang on. What? So, 
and yet that doesn't matter. Um, but there is one that I would mention has just come to mind, and that's got nothing to do with the fact of being in New Zealand or the fact that we've got a big mountain, right? Um, but that was Tolkien, right? And there were two aspects of his life that I, I felt uh, were worthy of consideration and to a degree emulation. The first of those was, because I'd never heard this term before, and I first came across his books when I was about mm, 11 years old, right? Um, and I'd never heard this term before, Oxford Don. I didn't know what this was. I thought it was some Italian thing, right? <laughs> and because as a child, what would you think? It wasn't until much later on, and, and I discovered that, oh, oh, okay, he actually taught at Oxford, and he was teaching at Oxford at the time, of course. Um, and I actually read some of his papers when I was in my teens that he had published about, you know, in uh, languages, the lost languages of Britain, actually. And one of his inspirations for some of the works that he wrote and some of the languages that he created was to try to fill the void of the lost history of Britain. Um, and it's always struck me as um, an impossible but worthy endeavor. The the other thing that caught me about him was his manner of writing, which is what we're familiar with in the, in the novels and the stories, and in the short stories. He wrote short stories as well. Um, um, was entirely different to the manner of scholarship, which told me that, well, here's a person who clearly had passion, but not in one thing, but in many things. So those two aspects. So we are so far surfacing um, the with Kate the idea of the many different characters, the many different personas we can choose to be so we are not fixed in, in any one way and we are then surfacing Ilet through your description of the assembly, the, the fact that the many people that we see outside of us that we can be on the inside. And we're now internalizing, Alan, the idea that he was a person you are describing that presented himself with a teaching, an artistic and a historic trace and combining the different sense of mystery and the rational and the mystical all in, in one person. So we're beginning to, to bring into this uh, symphonic idea of the human assembly some different dimensions. So let, let's see what else wants to appear in this, please. There's a few things that um, come to mind when considering the aspects of a human assembly and the curiosity that it posed in me when considering this was what are the things that are deposited in this life that were part of an assembly that could be built on 
the gems of what those people deposited. The things that would be kept and the things that would not be kept. And you don't know this. I certainly didn't know this when I was, say, in my teens. And it's, it's interesting listening to what other people say and that, man, there's so many different things that happen at different times of your life. And you're not really sure what impact they're going to have on you until you get to a certain stage in your life and you go, wow, that was an incredible lesson to get. Or, wow, I remember when I saw the quality in that person and I didn't realize what that person was like because I didn't understand the life that they had led before I met them. And it wasn't until later having the maturity to understand their assembly and why they did what they did, how they spoke, how they held themselves together. And those aspects that were talked about, the simplicity of life itself and the our aspect of even preparing a meal and realizing that when they were younger, they didn't have food. They knew what it was like to go hungry. And so therefore, when they ever prepared food for, say, myself or other people, they would do everything they could to facilitate that care. Or another person taking on the challenge of being an amazing performer in whatever they did and not realizing that that kind of actually was instilled in me, one of those deposits that would either make me want to do my best or be extremely competitive or not wanting to give up. So I was thinking about those aspects having that um, determination or having the empathy to know what another person, how hard they try at doing something. And then them understanding what's going wrong, but you're able to listen and they're able to respond back from that really true self-realization. And I suppose, I suppose that's probably the best introduction I could consider at this stage to do with the assembly and the archetype and the total encouragement that somebody would give to another life and how that could actually help to uh, fortify people, younger people and people at different ages into a better future for them. And that's my first attempt. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, beautiful. Thank you. Carol, the, the way I'm experiencing what you're describing is in the, the image and the realization that you're proposing that we are each an assembly of all the people that we interacted with. And especially all the people that that, as you see, you use the word deposit, deposited with us some of their essence, some of their hard-worn essence, whether by inclination, whether by their own journey and, and the, the quality they fashioned in, in their own character formation, in their own assembly, they transfer some of that residual deposit with us and we become the kaleidoscope of all those people we have experienced through life. So we, we're building here a, a multi-layered, multi-faceted uh, appreciation of this idea of a, 
human assembly in formation as, as a, as a um, on the move, shape shifting, evolving premise for a developing life. Please. Hi, it's been a fascinating journey so far, and I'm going to come from a slightly different angle. Um, because when I first thought about this question, it caused me to cascade backwards into my life. And it was interesting because I was not inspired. I was not inspired by people around me, and I could not understand the contradiction that I saw. And it actually made me a very angry teenager um, and very argumentative. And it was kind of interesting because I got to a point in my life and it was like, what is it all about? Do I just have to accept what the world thinks I should do? Or is there another option that I can pursue that surely there's got to be something deeper, something with more meaning than what the world was presenting me that I should be? And it's led me pretty much my whole life on a journey to find out what does it mean to be human? What is it that actually makes us human? What is the best of ourselves? What is the best of other people? Because it's incredibly easy to see the negative aspects of humans. And young people today are bombarded with so much more impressions and pressure to be something they're not. And I think that, you no, know, as a life, we're all like diamonds and we all come under certain pressures throughout the journey of our life. And it's in the fighting and the resisting and the determination to understand why we're here, what we can do, and what's really important. You know, that forms an assembly of account. And when I talk about someone of account, I'm not talking about famous people because most of the people that actually inspire me, most people don't even notice them. Yeah, but they are those people who have a desire to have things a certain way and they work towards that. They are the people who will stand up for injustice, who care for others, who take time for others. And I think the human is on an extraordinary journey and has found itself at a really interesting point in history where there's a huge kind of multiple transition happening externally in the world, but also internally inside each person. I talk to so many people and they are all going, what is going on? What is it all about? How are we supposed to be? How do we make it better? The idea of looking at a leader to provide the solution is no longer a valid one. And I think people have realized that. And people are realizing it, that it's all of us that need to do it. So I'll just do that as a bit of a, a starter. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. So 
the what switches on for me, what uh, comes alive as I internalize your starter is okay. So there is a way in which the quest for meaning, the quest for purpose, the quest to understand what is it all about to be a human at this time is by itself an impulse that chisels out of life the, the internal formation that we are proposing as the idea of a, of a human assembly, where the inquiry and the quest is the impelling, assembling uh, force. So I, I, I love what is beginning to emerge here that each and every one of us, each and every one of you, we, we are shining a light on a different aspect of this prospect of the human assembly, that we are, we have the capacity to build and shape and, and fashion an assembly. Uh, please, uh, who is ready to come next? Um, yes, indeed. It, and thinking about the, the proposition and the qualities um, of human assembly, what, what came to mind wasn't, it, it's like the others have said, it wasn't the, the bright lights of history and the big names. It's more a collection of many small stories all along the way of lots of little, um, something gets in. And it's it's really those enduring human qualities that have lasted the test of time and are still as valid today as they would have been in the past. And it, it's for me, it's like collect, collecting those. And then depending on the situation at hand, it may need from us to be firm or another one, another situation may need for us to be soft. They're not contradictory. They, they live in us quite happily, but we just bring to the forefront whatever's needed at the time. And it seems to be a growing and deepening of skills and qualities, um, this whole assembly building. And in thinking about some of the things that have maybe impressed me, yeah, it's not the big things, it's more just the little things. And I'll give a little example. Um, this is a story of my father, actually, when he was at boarding school, which is where you get sent away from home to, to school and you live away from home. And 50 years ago, they were a bit more strict than they are today. They had things called canes and um house masters and he'd been smoking cigarettes um and he put the cigarette out and he'd walking back into down the corridor and one of the big strict headmaster type people comes towards him baker you've been smoking baker and he could have said no got away with it or he could tell the truth and consequences generally not particularly pleasant um, he said, yes, sir. And then he got kicked out of the boarding house. He could still go to school, but he had to go and find somewhere else to live. Um, and so he did that. So what he did was he, he went away and worked out some more accommodation and told his parents once they sorted it all out. But the point was at that moment in time, he could have lied quite easily and got away with it. But instead he told the truth and in telling the truth, he paid a price for that. And there is a price to be paid, you know, to, it's not, they don't come cheap, don't come easy, but if you want good things, you, you do need to pay that price for it. And it kind of set a bar for me, but, you know, not let, not let, don't just cheapen oneself and let things go too easily. No, no, pay, pay the price. And, you know, fight for the good things. So that's what I'd say as a, as a starter. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. So the two dimensions I'm internalizing from your offering first is that assembly is, can be seen, can be fashioned in this idea that you can integrate a polarity. You can choose to recognize that you can be hard and firm and soft and gentle all at the same time with different situations, different situational requirements will bring to the foreground the different dimensions of assembly that's, that is situationally needed. So that really brings some of the practical dimensions of living an assembly life. 
where <clears throat> you respond and configure yourself situationally. And then your story about your father reveals that we fashion assemblies throughout our life, in, through the, even the earlier stages of our formation, in moments, in small invisible moments, where we, we decide to go one, in one direction, in, in one particular crossroad, we take the, the path that perhaps is less convenient, but we choose to take it nevertheless. Or if we choose the convenient path, it's another choice. These are the moments that, that fashion and crystallize an assembly. So, Yeah, it's fascinating, this conversation. I'm really enjoying it. And the different um, uh, insights that each one brings and the frequencies of the insights. Um, it's interesting what you said, um, Aviv, about uh, the combination of uh, different states. Because um, that was something that uh, I think attracted me from the very, very young age as an ar archetype. And I'm wondering, what is an archetype and are there archetypes? Um, maybe I imagine them like we are a source of water that is springing, that is unique. And then maybe there are some big rivers that we run into and some smaller streams that we fashion, and each combination is different. That's how I imagine maybe the archetypes. But coming back to combining different states, um, I remember I was uh, quite young when I first uh, read the novel, as Alan read Tolkien. I also read Tolkien and was very, very captured by it. Um, and I, I read uh, Zorba's The Greek, uh, that is uh, probably you've seen the movie. Uh, and it's about this man that is very grounded and um, it's um, a very uh, passionate, uh, lives the moment, um, enjoys, let's say, the juices of life and, uh, um, yeah, like a free spirit. He talks to God straight in the face and he says whatever he feels. Um, and he sees things as if he sees them for the first time. So he has this childish awe and innocence. And at the same time, he's together with Kazanzakis, who is um, uh, a writer, very spiritual and um, activist at the time. Uh, seeking for truth, tormented by duality. And um, yeah, so this, uh, this uh, exchange between the two, like the exchange between the spiritual dimension of the human and the seeker, and on the other hand, the very pragmatic and very realist and um, taking in consideration the gift of life, really, and living it fully. And I said, wow, that is fascinating that these states can be combined and uh, that you don't have to be one dimensional, but maybe both of these states can be combined. And I was always looking for these moments. Um, I remember the first time I saw in uh, uh, Easter, the, and I know we're touching religious subjects, the scene, you know, from the film of the life of JC, where JC is in the temple and he gets angry with, you know, the people selling and so on. And I say, I see these different faces of JC that he, he, he was loving and at the same time, but he got angry. So, okay. What's going on here? <laughs> I was very captured by that. Um, so I was always trying to to to, to find uh, people uh, who were multidimensional. I think they they inspired me. Um, 
And I had many role models, and like Pauline, from from from, from very young age, I uh, I was inspired by this, by the other, by these, uh, you know, different kinds of people from different walks of life, real or fictional or um, big figures. But I realized that as, grow, as I grew older, they changed. They changed. They didn't stay the same. And um, now as I'm getting older, it's like I don't want to have role models. I, I used to have a lot of role models now. It's like I want to shed the role models, all the role models. <laughs> I uh, maybe uh, something is rising that I want to find myself to be me, and uh, maybe marry these all these role models. Um, yeah, but kind of let them go, let them go as this as the snake leaves the skin, leaves the skin behind all the influence, all the role models, and emerge in, in what maybe a role model I can be. I don't know. It's a question mark. <laughs> I, I, I do see what Pauline is saying, that the, the young people, my daughters, for instance, are missing the kind of role models that will really move them and inspire them because they are bombarded by all these images. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kiriki. You took me in, in the first points you made in recognizing and appreciating the different inner states of Zorba the Greek to <clears throat> really the first point that Kate started with in the sense of um, <clears throat> I am not the things I do. I am not the roles I play. I am not all those other exterior definitions that I partake in. I can step into those when I need to, and yet I am something else, perhaps invisible, perhaps unknown, perhaps continually emerging and rediscovering itself. And there is a way in which I sense this property is the shaper of an assembly because what it strikes me as is the the sense the desire the the natural uh, spirit of freedom to be all the things I need to be and not be any of those things such that I can be and I, I don't know how to complete that sentence whatever it is you you describing at the end Kiriki, the sense of uh, needing to find yourself, which also captures the, the thread that Pauline offered in, yes, we are living into a leaderless time. We, this is the post-leader era. We used to look up to people and you can look up now and there isn't anybody to look up to, so you have to turn back. And look inside yourself. And I propose that that is the spirit of the time. We are meant to become adults in the universe. So here is a bit of my journey with some of the big names, actually, that shaped my life. The, the essential archetype of the character formation, the assembly maker for me, earlier on in life was Benjamin Franklin. Because when he was uh, 16, I think, he produced this list of 13 virtues, 13 qualities that he said he aspired to become. And he had a bit of an esoteric training for sure because he said, okay, so I'm gonna take a, these 13 virtues and I will dedicate a week in my life, every time, one week, to that virtue, that quality. And then I'll move to the next one. So you do the math, 13, there are 52 weeks in a year, 52 divided by 13 comes to 4. So that meant that he 
took each of those 13 qualities every year through the four seasons. So he was literally the, the gardener of his own assembly formation. It is said that towards the end of his life, he said he felt that he mastered all those virtues quite well, which told him that the 13 or one of those, which was humility, has probably, he probably has an opportunity to work on further because he felt so good about how he mastered those that suggested there was some work for him in the humility space. And then... I, on the run-up to our conversation today, over the last 24 hours, having arrived here in Singapore, I journeyed back to three figures that, for me, are seminal characters, truly of the 20th century, each one of which is inspirational in a different way and yet they are at the same time they represent a certain archetype the 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 20th century self-fashioning leader so i'm talking about gandhi about nelson mandela and being here in singapore about lee kuan yu gandhi now it's very interesting the three of them each, each one of the three of them were trained as a lawyer, which for me, when in a different context, when we travel through the story of the epoch, it's very interesting because they came into the shaping of the readiness to step into leadership in what in the epoch story is very much described as the, the modernity, the coming into prime of the modernity project through the, the fractal the influence of the blue modern project, the blue operating system. One of the typical influences of that is the modern fashioning of the profession of the law and the, the legal system. So they needed to be prepared into whatever role and function they were uh, destined to, to play out by being trained as a lawyer. So Gandhi then is able to negotiate with the Brits about the independence of India. And guess what? Lee Kuan Yew does the same in liberating Singapore to independence and Nelson Mandela in the shaping of the destiny of South Africa, yet again needed to have that formation of the, the legal system, the law, because he needed to be able to have the, I'm going to use this term again, mental assembly, the cosmology of mind that will allow him to negotiate with the powers that he needed to deal with, such that he would be able to act in his dystinic role. So each one of those, they go through a professional formation as a lawyer. And then I travel and I recognize that with each one of them, there is the interior dimension of the journey, not often known with the full depth how Gandhi was truly in his adult life, a practiced um, deeply, deeply immersed in the Hindu practice of Brahmachara in the sense of the purification of his character to the point that he is seeing his capacity to lead India to independence as something that he will do out of the purification of his character such that when the, the country is in strife, he goes into, I cannot solve it outside of myself, I will be fasting inflicting on myself the pain such that my body becomes the theater of purification for the state of India. Spiritual, devotional formation on the inside to inflict the pain of himself, almost saying, let me be the, I'm, I'm mixing traditions here, but let me be the sacred lamb to 
purify and liberate India from that strife and pain. And I will not stop my fasting until my people find peace. And in the desire that the people for his love of them will find the love in their heart to love each other. And then you go to the story of Mandela. So this become the, the, the formative crucible for Gandhi. He, he finds his point of inescapability inside of which he is forming his assembly, he is forming his character. You look at the story of Mandela and his formation is the, in the 26 years in Ruben Island. As a prisoner, in the defiance of the everything that's inflicted on him, such that he commands respect earlier on in the journey in the prison in Ruben Island from the prison guards because of the formation of character that he is building with himself and with his colleagues and how they are producing a kind of a philosophical club inside the prison, truly shaping the character that he will have to then show up with one day in the future. How can you be in prison for 26 years and then enter a dialogue with the clerk and be relevant without losing currency and relevancy? He is the entire 26 year journey on the edge of himself, always in the formation of his character and assembly. So for him, the prison becomes the, the crucible of the fashioning of his character and assembly. And then you look at the story of Lee Kuan Yew and he's got this aspiration that he will unite Singapore with Malaysia and, Malaysia and then that crumbles because they see in him to represent a threat to their vision and there is the separation of the unification of Malaysia and, and, and Singapore and he goes offline for six weeks. He cannot be accessed because he needs to go. He can't sleep for these six weeks. He, need to, he needs to go back in himself and in a way reconstruct a vision. And he comes out of that and he is birthing the vision of Singapore, modern Singapore, where a place of Mad hats has and 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 like no resources will become the thriving commercial center. And so there is a, a drive that's pragmatic, and what will he do for his people? And for him, the purification of his character and assembly is in his determination that he will he will literally become a what in the West was described as a benevolent dictator, okay, but recognizing that he will, by studying all that went wrong in many, many different places, he will become the embodiment of an assembly formation that will liberate Singapore to be what Singapore needs to be. And one of the most important aspects of that will be the, the quality of zero tolerance for corruption. So he becomes the embodiment of that. And there is absolutely enshrined in the, the ways and means and protocols and the constitution of Singapore zero tolerance for corruption. And so many other elements that he puts in place to enable Singapore to become what Singapore became. So now I come to Pauline, what you're describing as okay, we are in the post grand what Allen described that transition through the second half of the 20th century from the superhero archetype to we are now the leaders we have to look up to. Now the unique thing about these three characters, they are each a liberator of their people, of their nation. So I ask myself in my inquiry about assembly formation, what 
what can we do? What can we become? And this was something that in my 20s I grappled with because my father was the generation that escaped Europe in the Second World War, escaped the Holocaust with three of his brothers and sisters and his parents being murdered in Auschwitz. And he built the, was the central character in building the kibbutz movement in Israel. And I grappled for a long decade with what could I ever do that will equal that because the country was already built. And finally, it led me to the theme that we are all describing, each one of you from a different direction, which is we no longer have the established the state of Israel, liberate the people of India, establish Singapore, liberate and establish the modern South Africa. We are now, as you all said in different voices, engaged with the inquiry of what does it mean to be a human in a postmodern world? Where I cannot look outside of me for an, a, um, a mission that's so compelling that will allow me to spend the rest of my life outside of myself. Say, establishing the state of Israel, say, liberating the people of India, say, liberating South Africa. No, we, don't, we no longer have that way of being exonerated from needing to face ourselves on the inside. The, the prospect of this time is fashion the human assembly on behalf of being ourselves, almost saying, is there a way for me to become so fully myself in the most personal way and right there dissolve the personal to become the archetypal human that I can be in the unique way that I can be such that by giving birth to the liberation of being myself I then inspire the people around me, inspire the human possibility that that is actually the calling of this time we are post liberating the state, the country. We are now about the universal human, liberating the human potential by, guess what? Becoming so fully your liberated self to a point that you transcend yourself because you're so ready to, to embrace yourself. These are, these are words that we need to slow down even more to understand and discover what they mean it's easy for me to say these words at a conceptual level that the core inquiry here about the human assembly is to slow that conversation down. To say, well, what does it actually mean? To become truly yourself such that you then access the universal life that you represent, we each potentially represent. So we don't need to look up to the royals. We don't need to look up to the priests. You, we are rich. We can give rise to this, these qualities in the unique configuration, unique assembly formation that we each are. That is the, the essence of the inquiry. And I'd invite that uh, we build on this, whatever is whatever comes alive for you to, to um, speak to. Please. The first 12 years of life and, and the natural inclinations that are there, so much has been said, but um, it's interesting. Um, in New Zealand, um, one of the mantras that growing up um, – with the baby boomer generation after the Second World War, um, one of the mantras that was always on the lips of my parents was go outside and play. <laughs> and uh, so... Say that, say that one more time, go out. Go outside and play. And, and New Zealand children really wear shoes. They're not insulated from the planet. They, 
they run around with bare feet, which shocks people from other countries, funnily enough, uh, but is quite in the normal state of affairs here. And um, so reflecting back on the major influences, I was thinking about the mothering and the fathering as the grand archetypes, really, because uh, it was a very wholesome time, and uh, and going outside and playing, the planet was the mother, and the sun was the father, and those influences were felt like they were very nearby, and um, as well as being nurtured by a mother and a father. And when I thought about um, people in my life, it was, I felt very uh, almost cocooned inside of um, the exampleship of mothers and fathers and grandparents. And um, it's, it's funny because before the call, I had been on a few calls and I needed to go outside. And it was like there was a call and an urging to be out, to walk down to the river. And it's funny when you go down to the river, it has the transformative um, nature of pixelating you. And you lose all sense of time and you just muck around muck around and pick up rocks and that sort of thing, which, and you sort of get transported back to your childhood. So I had this, I, this persistent kind of voice that turned up to do with the mothering and the fathering of the natural worlds and the unseen worlds, that children are embraced by when they connect themselves to it. Um, and I have to say one other, th a couple of things that you mentioned the, the passing of the Queen, and it threw me straight back to um, a moment in time when I must have only been about three or four, because my mother loved the movies and she would go to the movies and because I was young and at home, she'd take me with her and she'd say, I'd give her a bag of lollies and she'd sit there and be perfectly, perfect little angel. And um, and in those days they'd play the national anthem and everybody stood up for the Queen in the picture theatre. And I utterly refused. I could not see the logic in it, even at that early age of three or four. It meant nothing to me, and it almost felt anachronistic. It's strange to say it, but at that early age, it felt like an anachronism and had no relevance. Um, and But I tell you, one movie that I must have seen at that early age I can't remember, I must look at when it came out, it was A Man for All Seasons. I saw it at a very early age and it had a huge impact on my life and about St. Sir Thomas More. And what impressed me about him was he educated his daughter and in educated local children. He made his house into a school, I think, at one stage. Um, and he was a man of principle. And he was prepared to stay to that principle steadfastly, uh, even though he, f even going against the king. And he did not compromise his principle. And it, and when they passed, you know, it was a 
set up trial, really, a punishing trial. And when they declared that he would be executed, at that point he said, now I will reveal the contents of my mind and spoke his truth where he stood. And uh, that that made a major impression upon me, even at the very young age that I was. And uh, so, yeah, I'll leave it there, actually. This point where you left, Aviv, what you were saying earlier, not too many years ago would have been called a heresy. Uh, and isn't that a mark in itself of how times have changed? Where we can, you know, where we can say such things. And, you know, there, there are famous people in history who uh, were called heretics for far less to dare to say that uh, the earth went around the sun. And so here we are at this odd juncture in the formation of a new history, um, perhaps on the leading edge of time, maybe. And, you know, the proposition is, well, who or what? shall we become and have we yet asked the question what qualifies as a selection of choice i have taught thousands of students at university over the last few decades. And some of those students, they, they, um, they still keep in contact. Um, some of them have become quite successful and the, they point out how, and I didn't know it at the time, I had influenced them in their career choices and things. And so the question comes up in me at this time, well, do I set myself up to become some kind of focal point? And what qualifies me to make that claim? Because surely to make such a claim is hubris. Um, when all I ever sought to do with these people is to help them to become or to actually even ask the right question first and then having found a question to ask to seek for the ways to address the question. And if that has helped them to become a more critically evaluative person, then I, I, I feel that I might have succeeded there. But little more than that, surely. What would you call this archetype? Uh, is it the, uh, the teacher, the liberator? Is it the teacher, the healer? Is it the teacher, the um, empowering? I wouldn't call it a teacher at all. Okay. No, because to teach means to pass on knowledge. And mostly I've never sought to do that. What I've sought to do is to create opportunities for inquiry. 
So if there was any archetypal reference, it would be um, that annoying challenge that won't go away. An opportunity maker, an inquiry instigator. These are the kind of archetypes you're describing. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. I've, I've, I've never sought to put a label on it. It's, it's quite curious. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, but, but, but in the suggestion that you're saying, so there was the archetype of a teacher and you have showed up for that role, discovering a new archetype that emerged in you, one of that you are describing with the quality of opportunity making, inquiry instigating, talent and capacity releasing. These are, these are the kind of new archetypal formations that are perhaps emerging in different professions and spaces. And yet, and yet there's a reverse side to this too, though. And this is one which I've encountered often in the past. Uh, those who feel the need to have their lives ruled by order and conformity feel threatened by such challenge. And, uh, and that's, that is also a reality that um, we, we have to be able to contend with and, and manage it. Well, manage it? No, it's not up to me to manage it, really, because I will often challenge their conformities. Um, I don't seek to make life easy for students. And I always have told them, no one ever told you that learning is easy. The real learning that you have here is not in doing the task. The real learning here is, is discovering afterwards what enabled you to complete the task. And for some people that's, well, recently I had a student come back to me 15 years after I'd last seen him and um, CEO of a $4.5 billion company. And um, he said, I hated it when you asked me that question and you gave me that challenge at that time. But I stopped and I thought. And three failed businesses, and, but this one is now a success. And I mm -hmm. wanted to come and tell you. It's quite interesting the kind of wording that you put with some of the responses of Eve. And what's intriguing is this aspect of, you know, what is it that we call some of these qualities that happen or are developed? And this one with the educator. Um, obviously, it's to do with different levels. And what Alan has just talked about is higher education and Alette, um, Alette has been involved with that as well in, in her many lives. And I think this aspect of, I agree, it's not necessarily the teacher as such. It's a little bit like the catalyst. It's a little bit like the disobedient thinker. It's a little bit like the person who dares to be lateral and not minding. It's the people who, if they're fortunate to spend the time with people, they have the ability to know, well, they would be an amazing person to work with in say five, six, ten years time, because by then they might accept the person that they are. But out of all the people that, you know, Aviv, you mentioned, and um, um, Alette, you just mentioned 
also someone. There's this aspect of the dedication to have a greater purpose in themselves. This is something that has come across really clearly in what has been identified. I was fortunate one time I went to um, be in the presence of the Dalai Lama and there was that dedication and the purpose of being involved with something more than themselves. This seems to be this quality that you're talking about that exudes, but it's there because of the longevity of what they were intensely devoted to. So any one of us, what are those things that we have done that we have been extremely devoted to that has enabled us to be that that stable, the person who perseveres, the person that sees the best, the person that will allow another person to just realize that they can not always rely on something that is technology and therefore have to always look at what other people are making but they will try and do something for themselves which is a little Pauline was saying before is I am totally and utterly grateful that I was not brought up as a di digital native in the sense that I would have been completely and utterly consumed by the very media that digital natives are consumed by. Working out things for yourself with the mind, with your complex, with your body, with your environment brings about an amazing pathway of being able to work things out, play with things and be able to acknowledge so much that you are capable of and be a little less fearful that it's not perfect or it's not right or it's not going to go the right way first time round because that is what is seen in today's younger people. They're too afraid to maybe take risks and only the top 5% will do it because that's, they've always done it. I think there's a lot in all of what you're talking about, every, every person. And that's just another little run at this time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll just put on a wee story that fits with the, the barefoot theme that Alette mentioned in the education and that uh, Helen was talking about. Um, one of the places in New Zealand you can't go bare feet is school. Um, you need to wear shoes. Now, there's a seven yesterday. So, 17 year old student, uh, his shoes have got very muddy from being out in the field, just totally sodden, cut in mud, couldn't wear them to school. So, his mother wrote a note saying, Can he wear these non regulation shoes today because um, his other shoes are going to take a while to get cleaned up? So he had a note saying, I'm allowed to wear, mum says I can wear non-regulation shoes. So he goes to the school office and the teacher looks at him and, no, not acceptable. Go to the property office and get someone, an old pair of shoes from someone else and wear those. And he says, no, I, no, I don't want to wear scungy old shoes, no thanks. And so the teacher says, right, well, you can go in the corridor over there for six hours. So, okay, so the student goes and takes himself just in the corridor for the first part of his six hours. And while he's there, he decides, right, they want me to be miserable. I'm going to be happy. So he put on some music and smiled away. Now, the next teacher that came by was the deputy principal. 
you know, this is, so she had another conversation. The game berated the student about not willing to go and get some shoes. And she said, well, why, why won't you go and put on these shoes? He said, well, originally it was because I don't want to put on scungy shoes, but now I'm just being stubborn. And so the deputy principal sees that this is just a silly situation. So she gave him the pass saying, okay, off you go then, go to class. Because it's, which is interesting because she rose above the ego, but lost the challenge of a student. But the best thing was to steer the student to class anyway. So the teacher wasn't going to be, they could see the pragmatic solution and her initial berating of the student, she had to put it aside to let him go. And the third part to this is talking to the student later. He said that if the principal had asked him to put on the shoes, the scungy shoes, the scungy regulation shoes, he probably would have. And the reason for that is because he'd had a previous dealing with the principal and he respected her. And I think the reason he respected her was because she just dealt with him human to human and, and not just some commodity or student. It was like they could develop a relationship. She talked to him human to human and he respected that. And so for that one, he would have worn the scungy shoes, even though the doctors would say that's silly. But, um, but just the, the three different responses that the different teachers could get from the student. One was just pure rebellion. The next one met the rebellion, but at least saw common sense. And the third one could actually get a better response. Um, and that's just an everyday example. And everyone has hundreds of these in their lives all the time. But just the different ways people can respond to a situation. And, and here what struck me is just people respond to humanity, the humanness. Mm. They respond to that. That's an enduring. So there we go. Another story about feet and education. Um, Aviva, I wanted to go back to um, a thread that you mentioned in the kind of weaving after we'd all had our first run. Um, there's actually a quote that is apparently comes from Gandhi. I can't verify it, but it's something that... Um, um, I've, I think is fantastic. And what it does is kind of bridge the gap between the in, internal life and the external life. And I think the, the phrase goes something like is when what you think and what you feel and what you do are in harmony. That's one of the definitions of happiness. So I think that um, you met, you've talked about, or we've, kind of put into the air that maybe this is the time that's post leadership, post great grand gestures. And that caused me to think that it's not that there are not a lot of inspiring people out there. There are. And I think that what I see happening and what gives me hope and inspiration is seeing groups of like-minded purpose-driven um, souls, people coming together to build grassroots projects and grassroots movements. And I see it happening everywhere. feels like the, the, there's a shift from the top down to some kind of groundswell where we become leaders in a more, in a smaller sense within our communities, within our circles of influence, within what has turned up in our lives. And some of those may grow and become something that will become greater than a local community, maybe into a national, maybe into something international. We don't know, but I feel that the way it happens is from the ground up from people being more in alignment with that, that they want to live according to their values and what they, what's important to them. And it's almost that you build, build something. Again, I think as the Gandhi said, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. It's a bit like that, that you build what you want to see and you live how you want to live. And you find people of like mind to do that with. Mm. And that starts to cause a change 
from the bottom up and from the inside out rather than waiting for somebody to come <clears throat> and legislate. You can see it happening in technology, in the environment. I mean, people are way ahead of the legislation, right, way ahead of the governments, way ahead. They, we realise we can't wait for politicians and governments and people to make change. We just have to get on with it. And I think that's mm -hmm. part of the leadership that I see is needed is just getting on with it and just being who you want to be and within whatever you can influence in your life and start there. Yes, I thought there was one other thing to add into this uh, following what Kate was talking about because there's this perception of a new type of leadership is required, a new and maybe leader isn't even the right language for it. Um, I work in the energy industry and it's going through massive change at the moment, as is every industry. Um, every aspect of human life seems to be transforming at the moment. And one of the things that they've realised in the energy industry is there's no big bang solution. There's not going to be the one transition. There is going to be multiple transitions. And then it's still not going to stop. It's going to be this constant evolution into whatever it's going to be. So people can't kind of see past the veil of, you know, um, what is the new energy system that's going to appear? What is the new human that's going to appear? It's, we're all going to have to explore ourselves and with each other to find the way to harmonize into a new future that seems to be appearing at this time. It's like, it's felt, it's registered, people can see we need to change. And it's like, one person is not going to take us there. One person is not going to do it. And part of the maturing that you were talking about with Eve earlier is a maturing of realizing, how can we harmonize together to move forward, to explore the new territories? Um, yeah, I'd just like to add that in. Yeah, well, thank you, Pauline. So, so let me try and, and do uh, a, a closing, offer a closing comment, really bridging something I'm, I'm internalizing from what Kate and what Pauline, what you offered. There is a story I've heard uh, earlier um, in, in the new century, the, the early 2000s of one of the high lamas, high Tibetan lamas who works closely with, with Dalai Lama, who when asked about the next generation of leaders and, and where are they, offered that the kind of pressure and the kind of intensity and the kind of challenge that living in the modern and now postmodern world represent that just fashioning the character to be able to go through the day-to-day -day machinations, hold the family, make the higher choices of living in the day-to-day -day stuff, that that by itself would require a character formation, the intensity of which equal the high lamas or the people that in ancient times would get water out of a rock to become biblical for a moment. The message being the central inquiry of our conversation today, which is we're saying in one way, could it be that we are post the large, larger than life leaders as we have known them? Could it be that therefore we are the people 
to represent in the small pragmatic moments of everyday life the kind of choices and decisions and assembly formation, character formation, whereby we are called to make those not on behalf of a nation, but, but on behalf of being a human in the complexities of modern life, where you cannot hide behind an ideology because you're faced with the complexity and the confusion of what do you do right now in the face of a child or an elderly person who are, who are in, you face their need and you need to be the principal and the pragmatic, the, the, the practical and the spiritual and you, you're there to integrate those complexities. And that right there in the face of this challenge, we are birthing this idea of becoming a human and finding the, the assembly formation of that moment in time. So perhaps we can leave it there, not with any conclusion, not with any definition, but as a first in a series of conversations to inquire about this idea of the human assembly, the formation of the archetypes that we are called to find in ourselves and with each other. And um, if this conversation inspired you to create a circle of your friends and build the inquiry, please and come join us in the next portals, conversations and events where we explore these kind of inquiries. Thank you all very much. Along with our website at portalsofperception.org, Portals is also available on YouTube and on all podcast platforms, as well as social media. You can become an active member and join the conversation in community events. And you can help us get the word out by liking this content and by sharing it with your friends.